Sunshine Agnes, Chapter 1, The Cream-Colored Girl Edwin Arnold had never been able to get the better of that girl. Not even once. He was confident in his physical strength and thought himself fairly sharp to boot. Yet despite that, he was caught in a losing streak that left him at a loss for words. Not much had changed since that day, two years ago. The ticking of the grandfather clock served as a reminder that time continued to pass inside the cafe. The 19-year-old Edwin, however, paid it no mind as he mumbled to himself in his usual spot by the counter. That's about as perfect as this article can get, right? Having fully incorporated the details from his interviews and proofread the writing three times already, he continued grumbling as he quickly made his final edits. If his piece could withstand the scrutiny of the afternoon's editorial meeting, he would finally get to be published. Edwin wasn't about to let a chance like that pass him by. He needed to make sure there wasn't a single period out of place. The boy raised his head and looked across the counter. What do you think, Agnes? Heck if I know. Who even cares? Agnes passed by with a yawn. Her curly cream blonde locks, which hadn't changed in two years, bounced and swayed with her every motion, as if dancing in a non-existent wind. Why do you have to come barging in here this early in the morning? We're not even open yet. She quibbled to herself as she dried the glass in her hand and placed it back into the cupboard. Come on, just look at it. I mean, please check it over. You know how rare it is for a rookie reporter like me to even get a shot at having their own column, don't you? Edwin pressed his hands together and bowed. Agnes stared down at him in silence. She had long gotten used to how much he depended on her for help, even though she was two years his junior. Jesus, he annoying, she thought to herself. Nevertheless, she relented, scanning the page as she dried another glass. Impressive work, Ace. You've racked up three spelling mistakes. And isn't the date wrong? Ugh, of course, Edwin thought. He raised his red pen once more and began making his corrections. It's not like fixing those will help you much now. What? If you've got something to say, then just say it. I'm putting my all into this. Chill out. It's just a cooking column. So what? An article is an article. I guess everyone starts somewhere. Still, I'm not sure you've got what it takes to be a reporter, Ed. She grumbled to herself while he toiled away at his corrections. You're a slow writer. You have zero attention to detail, and you're a numbskull to boot. Sure, you passed the paper's preliminary exam, thanks to my help, but isn't it a stretch to think you could become a real reporter? Agnes had long wondered why a terrible student like Ed would want to be a journalist. Even so, she immediately regretted speaking up as Edwin collected his draft, stood, and donned a wide smile. Whatever. Being a righteous reporter is cool. He told Agnes to expect good news and bounded out of the cafe, leaving the room silent, save for the chime of the bell above the door. How very, Edwin, Agnes shrugged. On the counter beside her, a drowsy black cat let out a yawn. Chapter 2 The Eaton News Agency Anchorville was a sizable city in the Republic of Calvert. Though it was smaller than the capital, it was still home to a respectable number of businesses. White streetscapes faced the mountains encircling the city, while Market and Harbor districts faced the river, creating a sweeping vista to behold. Rounding the corner of the market, Edwin pedaled hard on his bike, rushing down Sunset Street. The Eaton News Agency, a small, local publication, lay just ahead. The newsroom was in a frenzy, as nearly half the staff were standing and shouting. Royce, a veteran reporter, vigorously tapped the back of his fingers against a draft, unaware of Edwin's arrival. The business editor, Clef, held the telephone to his ear, looking as if he hadn't slept all night. The copy editor, or rather, editor-in-chief, Chang, nodded along with a stern expression. From what Edwin could glean, there had been a delay covering a recent traffic accident, he kept to himself, slipped into his seat, and took out his trusty, worn-out bag. Well, someone's in a good mood, despite being late. 
The voice that cut through the commotion came from Brandon, a middle-aged man with salt and pepper hair, who was the editor of the culture section. Upon seeing his supervisor, Ed wasted no time, shoving his draft into Brandon's face. Today's article's perfect. Please, submit it at the editorial meeting for me. There better not be any spelling mistakes this time, unless you're looking to get scolded again. Edwin's broad smile returned. Everything's going to go great today. I guarantee it. Suddenly, one of the office's four phones rang. A reporter named Carly answered it while passing by. What? Carly's brow furrowed. At 5 a.m.? Yes, yes. Carly waved an arm through the air. The editorial department, which until then had been noisier than a train platform, fell silent. Setting down the phone, Carly turned her gaze to Chang. Mr. Chang, it seems Weber Hart is dead. Someone clapped twice, shouting, I need all the political columnists to gather around ASAP. Right, right. yelled the reporters, rising to their feet. That guy, huh? This is going to be a big local story. The crowd murmured amongst themselves as more than 10 staffers circled the editor-in-chief's desk. Who was this heart guy again? Seriously? He was a big shot around here. He was a famous intellectual. How do you not know him? This one's going to require a special feature. Brandon muttered begrudgingly under the chatter. He tossed Edwin's draft back to him. The afternoon editorial meeting's canceled, Ed. You're going to be assisting on this story. Huh? But why? Don't why me. I'm your editor, pal. Do as I say. Seeing Brandon's scowl, Edwin leapt to his feet by instinct, but was suddenly overcome by a sharp sense of vertigo, as if the ground were shaking. Upon seeing the others in the room do the same, however, he realized that it actually was. The sound of steel folding in on itself shrieked through the office from outside the agency, followed by the grating roar of metal grinding against concrete. The cacophony ended with a crash. Through a trembling window, Edwin saw an overturned orbital bus billowing smoke into the sky. In a flash, he ran out of the newsroom as fast as he could, bag in hand. It wasn't his instincts as a reporter that made him move, but the fact that he could have sworn he saw Agnes amidst the panicked crowd. Chapter 3. Golden Eyes Agnes! Edwin dashed into the street and toward the next block over. He was positive that he had really seen Agnes, as well as confident that he could catch up to her. Indeed, there she was in a crowd ahead. For a brief second, their eyes met. But a fleeing bystander bumped Edwin's shoulder, and when he looked back, she was gone. What? Why is she running from me? Edwin wondered. Another explosion rang out as the overturned bus burst into flames once again. Edwin cursed as he ran to the door of the bus and took off his coat to smother the fire. As he attempted to wrench open the door, cries for help spilled out. The bus driver's limp hand dangled from the window. It doesn't matter if my draft ends up in the paper or not, Edwin thought. Never underestimate a righteous reporter. We're going shopping today, all right, Kagemaru? After seeing Edwin off earlier that morning, Agnes was preparing to go out herself. The night before, she had remembered that her uncle's birthday was coming up. Agnes' uncle, who once owned the cafe, would be turning 40 this year. Were it Edwin's birthday, she would sidestep the topic as too much of a hassle though she would still end up getting him something, the way she had last year and the year before. However, she couldn't treat her uncle, to whom she owed so much, the same way. Agnes set down her glass of water to scold Kagemaru, who was still asleep on the counter, for the umpteenth time. Are you even listening to me, lazy bones? She asked. The black cat's only reply was a deep yawn that contorted its face into an ugly abstraction. Honestly. As her uncle carried beer bottles into the back, Agnes let him know that she was heading to her room on the second floor. Maybe I should put on something more comfortable. 
She was in and out of her room in a flash, returning down the hall wearing a light tank top. Mid-stride, she grabbed her favorite knit cap from its peg on the wall and put it on as she hummed her way down the stairs. Kagemaru stared at her blankly. What? No one saw me. So what's the big deal? She shrugged at the fussy feline and opened the door. Let's get going, Kagemaru. With a graceful leap, the black cat landed atop her knit cap, sending her cream-colored curls flying. I can't believe you, she thought. The most inconvenient aspect of Agnes' waist long hair was how much it bounced. She attempted to smooth her locks down here and there, but they simply couldn't be tamed. Ten years ago, Agnes' mother disappeared. Her father was good to her, so she continued living with him until she turned 15. However, her father couldn't give up on finding his wife, so he entrusted Agnes to his brother and left in search of his beloved. In time, Agnes came to understand their feelings, to the point where it made her ache. Her mother surely loved her father just as much as he did her. What to do, what to do? Agnes sighed. Multiple stalls lined the harborside market. She'd come in search of a gift, but hadn't considered what she was actually going to buy. I should have just asked Uncle Early. Her aside was interrupted by an horrible bus hurtling past. The large bus had drifted out of its lane, hit the median, and launched into a truck going the opposite direction. Its shining green chassis glared in the sunlight. The tires had begun to fly, twisting in odd directions. The driver must already be dead, thought Agnes as she watched the bus soar in the air. Her mind was in turmoil, yet at the same time, she had never been more calm. Once the bus hit the ground, they would all die, from the man in the front row to the pregnant woman by the window. Kagimaru. Answering the call, the black cat opened his golden eyes. Agnes did the same. Amidst the screams of people running for their lives were four golden eyes gazing at a scene that had yet to unfold. Chapter 4. Cry for Justice Edwin rescued one passenger after another. The corner market had devolved into panic in the wake of the crash. Worse still, the truck the bus had collided with had been carrying flammable materials. Edwin coughed violently as hot, thick smoke filled the air around him, searing his skin. I can't give up, Edwin thought. There are still people left inside who need me. Help me! Grab my hand! It's narrow, but I can get you out. Everything's going to be all right. I can't! I'm pregnant! Wh what Edwin shouted without thinking. He tried to get a hold of himself, but his thoughts were spiraling. He was only 19. This was way out of his depth. Mind racing, he frantically tried to calm the woman, telling her to wait while he stood and surveyed the area. Several cars that had been caught up in the crash lay motionless in the street. Brandon and the news staff had followed Edwin outside to assist the rescued passengers. Sirens wailed faintly in the distance. The cavalry was on its way at last. Ed, you gotta get down from there, yelled Brandon. That truck is loaded with gunpowder. It could blow at any second. Like hell I will. Edwin suddenly became enraged. Why did this accident happen? Why are there so few people helping? He yelled to himself. And why did Agnes run from me? Edwin had a feeling that she fled out of shock after spotting him. He knew better than to be upset, though. It was only natural that someone would run if a huge orbital bus came hurtling toward them. The thought, however, did little to calm his rage. Why did you run away, Agnes? You idiot. Who said anything about running? Cold water suddenly engulfed Edwin's body. Bewildered, he turned around only to then meet Agnes' beautiful blue eyes. She stood there, panting with a bucket in hand. Edwin could only assume it had belonged to a fishmonger, seeing as now he reeked of fish. Nice work, kid. Leave the rest to us. Everyone, this way, hurry! A brigade of bucket-armed fishermen and fishmongers appeared behind Agnes. Together, they doused fires left and right in quick succession. Oh, of course. We're next to the harbor, thought Edwin. 
Agnes' hair swayed to and fro as she bounded around, barking out orders. You, get over there! You, go fetch a hatchet! This girl is something else, Ed whispered. Ed, get out of my way! That woman's pregnant, right? The girl climbed over the frame of the bus. Taking the woman by the hand, Agnes gently coaxed her to freedom. She then turned to Edwin. You know this would have been way easier if you hadn't come, right? Huh? What did you have to say that for? Edwin shouted. The girl with cream blonde hair cracked a relieved smile. Don't worry about it. You really are dense, you know that, Ed? After sunset, the clattering of a cocktail shaker was the only noise disturbing the silence of the cafe. Agnes' uncle liked to serve the hard stuff in the store at night. The repetitive sound of the shaker was disrupted by the door flying open. Agnes didn't bother to look. She knew it was Ed. So, how did it go? She asked, still facing away from him. Everyone's in stable condition. Edwin recited the facts he had learned from the police and hospital reports. There were only minor burns and injuries, excluding the bus driver, who died even before impact. Considering the circumstances... People were calling it a miracle, one aided by a speedy rescue, of course. Edwin continued. And the cause of the accident was, the driver died at the wheel and the bus went out of control, right? Interrupted Agnes. How did you know that? She shrugged as she cranked up the orbital radio, which was tuned to a report on the accident. Say, Ed, maybe you aren't cut out to be a journalist after all. Personally. I think you'd be better off working as a full-time hero. Hmm. Edwin rubbed his hands and glared. Hey, toots, go get me a bourbon. Quit trying to act tough, Ed. I know you don't drink. Here, let me get you an iced tea. As she prepared his drink, Agnes wondered what the bus driver's cause of death was. The host on the Orbal radio was now covering a different traffic accident. Feels like there have been way more accidents than normal lately. She mused to herself as she grabbed a new glass. Chapter 5 The Winds Blow Downhill June gave way to July. On the fourth of the month, Edwin Arnold was set to attend his first ever press conference, as an assistant to the higher-ups of the political column, that is. The contentious inheritance of Weber Hart had been a matter of great public interest, since the great intellectual's sudden passing one month prior. And his closest living heir, his adopted son, died at sea shortly after Hart's own death, Edwin noted as he pedaled his bike. Just ahead is the Cromwell Street Hill. Today's the day. I'll reach the top without stopping even once, he shouted with his trademark enthusiasm. <sighs> Hart's best friend and the chairman of the board are both laying claim to the inheritance, However, there are rumors that the son's death was perpetrated by the two men themselves. Edwin's breath grew ragged. Hmm, that's a pretty common plot. Still, could the rumors be true? Heck if I know, muttered Agnes, watching the scenery go by. She was sitting behind Edwin on the luggage rack. The bike's vibrations shook both her and the insulated bag in her arms. As it happened, there were many coffee lovers at the Eaton News, including Ed's boss, Brandon. Agnes delivered her uncle's artisanal blend there once a week. The catering service was little more than a hobby for Agnes, but she tolerated it well enough. The fact that Edwin insisted on escorting her during deliveries, however, was just a bit bothersome. So, Ed, you still hoping to land that cooking column? She asked. Yeah, I'm supposed to do one next month, so I'm putting together a new article. Gotta write about whatever's in season, after all. <laughs> a righteous reporter getting his start from a cooking column, mused Agnes. Being with Edwin like this put her at ease. As she fussed over her hair, which was fluttering in the wind, atop her head, the perennially drowsy Kagimaru let out another yawn. You just don't get it, do you? Edwin tisked. There was no shame in a cooking column. I'd be helping my readers spice up their dinner tables. If my article can make even one person's life easier. 
Edwin began pedaling up the hill with all his might. Who says there isn't justice in that too? He roared. The bicycle crested over the hill, letting gravity pull it over to the other side before propelling effortlessly down the slope. Agnes let out an astonished yelp, only for it to be drowned out by Ed's joyous cries as he picked up speed. They continued on and on, riding the rushing wind. This exhilaration Ed's feeling must be his reward for working so hard, thought Agnes. She clutched her knit hat to her head to keep it from flying off and laughed at herself for being so shocked. Ed was always looking ahead. He was always chasing after his ambitions, with that one-track mind of his, sometimes to the point where it annoyed her. About what you said back there. Huh? Sorry, I can't hear you. Agnes raised her voice to yell over the wind. That rumor about Mr. Hart's heir being killed for the inheritance. Someone might have done it if they thought for sure they wouldn't get caught. Edwin nodded several times in sage understanding. Got it. I'll ask about that in today's interview. Jeez. And where's that going to get you? Ed was as dense and simple as they come. But that was also the reason Agnes felt so at ease around him. The reason they got along so well. She made sure he wasn't looking before grinning widely in a way she'd never shown anyone before. Today, Edwin had made another step toward adulthood. He might stumble and make a fool of himself, but she knew he would keep pushing forward like always. She only wished she could be there to watch it herself. Agnes! What? If something ever happens, call me, okay? I'm a righteous reporter, after all, yelled Edwin. His laughter echoed across the clear blue sky. Chapter 6 Fisher After dropping Agnes off at Eaton News, Edwin was led by a group of senior reporters to the largest assembly hall in Anchorville. There, he would attend a press conference concerning the matter of Mr. Hart's enormous inheritance. All right, let's go get this story. Edwin psyched himself up. He had been told to save some seats for his team, but as he hurried to the press room, he found himself twisting through a maze of unfamiliar corridors. He wasn't quite sure what was happening. Where am I? Where in the world is the press room? Edwin's irritation grew, and his pace quickened. He checked doors at random, all of which only led to storage rooms and more corridors. He could already picture Agnes sighing and saying something sarcastic about his total lack of direction. Steadying himself, he pressed on. Just then, a loudspeaker announced that the conference would begin in 20 minutes. That's not good, murmured Edwin. Losing patience, Edwin flung open the nearest door. Upon it was a plaque emblazoned with golden lettering that read, Waiting Room 105. Inside stood a man in his late thirties adjusting the necktie on his rather fashionable suit. Oh, I was under the impression that we still had some time before the press conference, no? He asked. Edwin recognized him. He'd seen the man in photos of the Hart case's major players. This was neither Hart's best friend nor the chairman of the Hart Foundation. Rather, he was the middleman charged with managing all of Hart's assets while he was still alive. Someone deeply invested in the inheritance case. You're the estate manager, Ox Montaigne, cried Edwin, completely ignoring Montaigne's question. I'm Edwin, and I'm with the Eaton News. May I interview you about today's press conference? Edwin's request was completely ridiculous. It was as if he was trying to hog the entire story for himself. Hux was flabbergasted, but Edwin wore his usual serious expression. The division of the inheritance needs to be agreed upon by both parties, I'm not really sure how it will pan out. I'm a tax counselor, not a lawyer, Montaigne explained, sinking back into the cushions of a black leather chair. He'd agreed to divulge what he could, partially out of sympathy. The easiest solution would be a clean 50-50 split, but since there are properties and valuable items to consider, I can't imagine either party will surrender without a fight. The total inheritance is substantial, right? Could either of them be gunning for the whole thing? No comment. That doesn't concern me. Uh, I see. 
Then do you know anything about the death of the original heir? Mr. Hart's adopted son last month. Hmm. Silence gripped the room. Montaigne, who had been cooperative thus far, was as still as a statue. Crap, did I go too far? Edwin thought. That's the kind of question a tablet would print. As Ed realized the impropriety of his question, Montaigne quietly shifted his right hand, tapping his middle finger against the end table before touching his temple with his index finger. Edwin wasn't sure what the gesture was meant to convey. This might be a little too frank, so please keep this off the record. But speaking personally, I have no interest in Mr. Hart's inheritance, said Montaigne. It's true that there is a considerable amount of money on the line, but I don't believe it's enough to warrant killing someone over. Montaigne continued, You may already know this, but there are things in this world of even greater value, things beyond human comprehension. Like, for instance, a clan of magicians, perhaps. The newsroom was nearly deserted. All the reporters had left to cover their stories. Agnes refilled the cups of the few remaining staffers as she scanned the room. Between an unfinished draft left on the desk and some unedited notes posted on the wall, Agnes had a decent idea of what tomorrow's issue of the Eaton News would look like. Seems Ed won't be getting his chance anytime soon, she thought. Yet another car accident, too. It really feels like there have been way too many of those lately. Her eyes landed on a picture near the front of the room. Excuse me, Mr. Chang? Who is this man? Even though the newsroom was restricted to employees, no one reprimanded Agnes for being there. Not even Chang, who was notorious for being a stickler. He simply gave her a glance and identified the man as Mr. Hart's estate manager. Apparently, the photo was taken at a press conference two days ago. Looking at the shrewd businessman's photo filled Agnes with dread. This man could destroy me, she thought. He may even know who I really am. Chapter 7 Edwin's Justice Montaigne told his story. Long ago, in the time of the world's creation, written of in the Testaments, mankind possessed the ability to use arts at will. Over the ages, this ability became lost to time. Nowadays, the only way to access arts is via the use of an orbment. However, one clan inherited that lost power. They are known as magicians. They exist in the present day, living normally among the rest of modern society. I know this is a lot to take in, so I can hardly blame you for being skeptical, chuckled Hux. However, I suspect that there may be a magician in our very own city. Perhaps they are even closer to us than we realize. Now, with that in mind, reconsider the death of Mr. Hart's adopted son. If he truly was murdered by inexplicable means, perhaps it was the work of a magician. Afterward, Montaigne warned Edwin to keep the story to himself. Tell no one, not even your family he said. Or next time, it'll be one of us turning up dead. Edwin was once a selfish and naive child. That is, until one day when he was 14 or 15 and saw a reporter's article exposing the evil deeds of some big-shot politician in a faraway land. The legislator had used his position and the suffering of others to line his pockets with Mira, but the expose destroyed his career. Afterwards, the reporter casually remarked that it was their job to reveal the inequities of the world and attempt to right its wrongs. Since that day, Edwin's sense of justice centered on uncovering everyday hypocrisies and shining a light on the vague and obscure. Magicians, pondered Edwin. If people like that really are hiding out there, I'll just have to expose them myself. The newsroom was as busy as ever. Ed, in particular, was engrossed in his work as of late. He had even stopped going to the cafe and asking Agnes to check his drafts. What the heck is he up to? She wondered. Ed, are you there? Agnes called out in a relative whisper. 
yeah, what are you doing here? As soon as he saw her, Edwin scrambled to put away the manuscript he had been working on at his desk. Agnes, who had managed to catch a brief look at his documents before he set them aside, thought they looked like the kind of materials he would gather before writing an article. There was an itemized breakdown of Mr. Hart's inheritance, notes from the press conference, a statement made by the estate manager, Mr. Montaigne, a brief story about a girl with a ribbon, and a revision request from Brandon to reformat the personal history of the board's chairman. She also spotted two spelling mistakes on his working draft, but Edwin's distant attitude had miffed her, so she decided to keep them in her back pocket as ammo to tease him with the next time he came to the cafe. I was out making deliveries, so I brought you lunch. You haven't eaten yet, right? Ah, good timing, Agnes. Thanks for saving me the trouble. Edwin snatched the wrapped sandwich from her hand and made an immediate beeline for the door, mumbling an excuse about chasing a story with his mouth half full. Something about his clumsiness seemed different than usual, to the point where Agnes felt lightheaded as Ed vanished from sight like a fleeting mirage. Was it just me, or was something off about him? She glanced over to Brandon and Carly for answers, but all they could do was shrug, looking no less troubled than her. Uneasiness and confusion were written all over their faces. What does all this mean? What the hell is that up to? Chapter 8 22 Cards of Fate Part 1 Agnes was still shaken up by Edwin's behavior, even after she returned from the Eaton News. Normally, he was so straightforward and easy to read, but now... She wiped down the countertop and rearranged the glasses and silverware in an attempt to calm herself, but her anxiety remained. The only customer, Old Man Purdue, sat at a nearby table, chatting leisurely with Agnes' uncle. He waved to Agnes, and she responded in kind. Do you have any ideas, Kagemaru? She asked. Kagemaru was curled up on his favorite spot on the counter, just left of Edwin's usual seat, the cat stared at her with his usual lethargic look. Yeah, I figured as much, she thought. Agnes reached for her knit cap, but stopped herself. Even if she ran out searching for Ed now, she knew she wouldn't be able to find him. He had his bike and was bound to be on the move at all times, with how worked up he was. Instead, Agnes opened a drawer behind the bar and removed an old-looking deck of tarot cards. Yeah... He's ought to do the trick. Pinpointing lost items through tarot card readings was well within the clan's rules. Every now and then, Agnes would even do some fortune telling for their regular customers. It was nice to hear them tell her she had been right. But what really made her happy was getting to use her powers freely. Reading a fortune for one's own benefit, however, was wholly forbidden. After all, too much knowledge can be a danger in and of itself. Agnes hesitated briefly before undoing the string that bound the deck together. There was something off about Edwin today, I'm sure of it. She exhaled deeply before placing her fingers upon the stack of cards. Imagining the possible answers the deck held, no matter how small, calmed Agnes. Excuse me, miss! Suddenly a cute little girl about ten years old stood before her. Can I help you? Agnes asked as she took her hands off of the cards, wondering when the girl had come in. Are you telling fortunes, miss? Can you do mine too? The girl introduced herself as Tize and said she was looking for answers. She fidgeted with the red ribbon she wore. Apparently her father was in the middle of a difficult job and she wanted to know how it would turn out. Well, I... Agnes wondered if the little girl was from the area. She'd never seen her before. Her request came at a fortuitous moment, though. Agnes was reluctant to use her powers for herself, but she had far fewer qualms about using them to help others. Well, I'll make an exception just for today. What'll it be, Tizzy? I'll take one single request. Wow, really? I never lie, and neither do my tarot cards. Chapter 9 22 Cards of Fate, Part 2 
Tizza seemed even younger than she looked, the way she asked about the meaning of each and every card. As the girls sat side by side at the counter, Agnes continued performing the reading. The results were... adequate. Let's see. From what the cards are telling me... Your papa's work is finishing up well. Everything should be just fine. Agnes smiled. Tizze beamed with gratitude, but it was actually Agnes who wanted to thank her. The overwhelming anxiety had vanished, and she felt more like herself again. She waved goodbye as Tizze left shortly after, the doorbell chiming as the door swung shut behind her. Now then, what about Ed's fortune? Agnes thought. She sat at the counter and carefully gathered the cards. Her palms were sweaty, but she tried to ignore them. It's not important, Agnes muttered. When it came to more serious readings, Agnes always used the same procedure. First, she would make a fervent wish, then draw a single card. In Agnes' case, this was the most reliable method. All right, Ed. Just what are you up to? Miss, you dropped one. Huh? For some reason, Tizzy was once again standing beside her. The girl crouched and picked up a card from the floor. Agnes took it and thanked her. Glancing down at the card, she suddenly froze, as if she had been petrified. It was death, the reaper's card. Agnes was overcome by dizziness and, in her daze, failed to notice Tizze's departure. The leaky faucet stopped dripping. The cards in the deck shifted. Then, one after another, they rose from Agnes' left hand and floated in the air. But the solitary object of Agnes' focus was the card before her. Death. A heavy thud brought Agnes back to consciousness. She looked up and saw Kagemaro staring back at her, perched on her head. At that moment, the tarot cards hanging in the air fell to the floor. Kagemaru? The cat hopped nimbly onto the counter and pointed his drowsy eyes at her, as if to say, What do you think you're doing? Uh, I know. I was just a little surprised, is all. Agnes muttered to herself as she gathered the scattered cards. For whatever reason, her uncle and Purdue hadn't noticed anything. That was careless of me. I need to forget about all this and get back to work, she thought. Then again... Agnes placed the death card on the counter and drew a card from the now reshuffled deck. She couldn't read the same fortune twice, so instead, she tried to focus on whatever it was that Ed had been chasing this past week. For our next story, yet another traffic accident occurred at around 1.40 this afternoon. The orbital radio buzzed, having turned on by itself. I must be putting too much power into the reading, Agnes thought. After shaking off her dizziness, she turned her attention to the newly drawn card. The sun reversed. In other words, darkness. Agnes pondered the potential meaning of the second card. There had been more accidents than usual lately. Perhaps darkness was linked to those events? Maybe Ed found a lead on it somehow and was stepping into the darkness alone. Kagemaro meowed chidingly, a languid expression on his face. I know, but Purdue and Uncle haven't noticed a thing, Agnes retorted. She reached for the deck of cards again, but stopped herself midway. It would be faster to ask the Eaton news staff about Ed's whereabouts. She hurried to the orbital telephone beside the clock and called the office. Eaton News, how may I help you? Oh, Brandon, sorry to bug you, but around noon, Edwin ran off somewhere to work on his article. Do you happen to know where he went? Ed? Brandon chuckled. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's been here working at his desk since this morning. Agnes' face went pale. Ed was at his desk? N no, that can't be the real Ed, she thought. Outside, a piercing sound echoed from the front of the cafe. Agnes watched through the window as a crushed orbital scooter sailed through the air and careened into the street. Its driver seemed to be dead before it even hit the ground. And yet, Purdue and her uncle continued to chat as if all was right with the world. Agnes shook them by the shoulders, but neither reacted. She had no idea what was going on anymore. Then, 
The world began to violently shake beneath her, and she squatted in place. Agnes was just now beginning to grasp the depth of the terrible power running amuck in Anchorville. I've got to stand, she thought. As she pulled herself up, Agnes peered over at the death card on the counter. For now, it was the only truth she could believe in. Chapter 10 Path of the High Priestess The grandfather clock in the parlor struck twice, and Agnes quietly left her room. By the light of the moon, she passed through the cafe and unlocked the front door, slipping out into the chilly night. The day before, she had wound up drawing one final card to determine when she would make her move. It was the High Priestess, the second arcana, which to her meant 2 a.m., Ed is still okay, Agnes assured herself. I just know it. Surely, leaving at two in the morning would get her there in time to save him. She looked down and noticed that her hands were shaking. I can't get ahead of myself, though. Ed could die if I'm not careful. I just need to follow the cards and wait until 2 a.m. before doing anything. Meow. Kagemaru roosted upon Agnes' head. He was heavier than he looked. Agnes wondered if his laziness was making him fat. Still, it brought a certain sense of comfort having his weight over her head. She took a deep breath to center herself beneath the glow of the full moon above. Let's get going. Now in better condition, Agnes closed her eyes and felt out the septium veins beneath the earth, searching for where they grew stagnant. She then walked down the dimly lit streets, guided by her instincts toward the darkness beyond. Anchorville nights were cold, even at the height of summer. Agnes wore a light sweater, her cream-colored hair complemented by the pale moonlight. The Esmolus necklace she wore jostled in time with her every step. The tiny stone was all Agnes had left of her mother. The memories were so distant that she couldn't even remember her face. When Agnes was just a child, her mother left without a trace after using her powers in public. Such were the laws of her clan, and although Agnes couldn't recall how she learned that, she knew exactly why it was so. We carry dangerous potential within us, she recounted. We must keep it hidden and live amongst the others. Before long, the road led out of the city and ended at the base of a large hill. A cemetery, Agnes whispered. At the top of the hill were rows of black tombstones. Among them, she spotted something moving about. Edwin, he's here, Agnes exclaimed. There was no mistaking it. She recognized him by the coat he was wearing. It was still charred from the traffic accident several weeks back. I've told him so many times to get rid of it, but he's still wearing that ratty thing, she thought. Agnes removed Kagemaru from her head and held him in her arms, crouching behind a gravestone. She berated herself for wearing such a conspicuous outfit. Regardless of her lack of foresight, however, she knew Edwin was in mortal danger. After steadying her breath and carefully gauging the distance between the two of them, Agnes crept quietly into the shadows. Chapter 11 Left Only to Scream Agnes could tell that Edwin was making a clumsy attempt to tail someone through the graveyard. His lackluster performance was actually beginning to irritate her. Jeez, he's going to get caught if he keeps this up, Agnes mumbled. That being said, she couldn't see who Ed was pursuing from her place in the shadows. Eventually, the chase concluded, rather uneventfully, at the top of the hill. Something's up, Agnes thought. By then, Ed had come out of hiding and was facing an unknown figure. Sorry, she gave me the slip again. Well, these things happen. Damn it, I thought for sure tonight would be the night. Still, Mr. Montaigne, was that little girl really created by a magician? Without a doubt, inside that human-looking shell is a malevolent power, an evil spirit. You've done your research so I know you're aware that she's been present at each and every accident. The man said as he waved his right hand in front of Ed. 
She steals lives with a single diagonal strike through the heart. He continued, tracing a line across his chest. Evil spirits create disturbances, and only magicians can perceive their presence. <sighs> Is that so? Edwin sighed. Seems you don't fully believe me yet. In that case, let me tell you something else you may find interesting. The man leaned over to whisper into Edwin's ear, but in the calm of that moonlit graveyard, it felt as if he was speaking directly to Agnes. If you kill a magician, you can steal their powers. Agnes reeled, overcome with vertigo, rustling the weeds at her feet. She cursed at herself under her breath. Killing a magician? How could I be so blind? The estate manager, Hux Montaigne, I've completely fallen into his trap. She scolded herself. What the? Dagnus? What are you doing here? Do you realize what time it is? Edwin was so dense that she wondered if she might be able to use it to her advantage. She stood, focused not on Edwin, but on Hux Montaigne instead. So I've been your target this whole time, huh? I wasn't aware you were such a young lady, though. All those horrible acts, so much death, just to get to me? You make it sound so frivolous, when in fact, this is the only way for an imitation like me to gain more power. Ed, run! Get out of here! Agnes dashed straight at Montaigne. I've got to close the distance and get him away from Ed, she thought. Suddenly, Kagemaru, who had left Agnes' arms to run alongside her, turned around midway and meowed out in warning. Uh. An invisible force swept Agnes' legs out from under her, like she'd been flipped from behind. She somersaulted to the ground, a sharp pain coursing through her. Blood was gushing from her thigh. Something had pierced through it. A child's laugh echoed behind her as a red ribbon fluttered in the wind. You're the little girl who was at the cafe today. Tis eh? My papa's work is finishing up well. You told me so yourself. Tizze's porcelain skin undulated in the moonlight, as if something was squirming beneath the surface. My daughter's quite well made, isn't she? Boasted Hux. Agnes screamed with all her might. Ed! Get away from him! A stunned Edwin then shook himself back to his senses finally beginning to process the events transpiring before his very eyes. So all along, this evil spirit we've been chasing the past week was really just this... thing you call your daughter? Montaigne, it was you all along. You're the magician! He shouted. This man is fake, thought Agnes. He's just using the powers he stole from a real magician, from Weber Hart. Run, Ed! Please, she yelled. Get out of here! Montaigne deftly raised his right hand, as if he were commanding the attention of a rapt audience. My dear Edwin, I must thank you for bringing me the girl. However, this is the end of our partnership. Now you shall become a part of my power. Huck's motioned toward the boy with his white fingers, and a crisp snap rang in Edwin's ears. Just like that. Edwin's eyes rolled back, and his body fell to the cold ground below. Chapter 12 Eclipse Atop the Hill God, what is she doing? Echoed Edwin in the haze of his semi-conscious mind. Agnes was crying, sobbing even. She looked like she was hitting something, but she lost the advantage and was sent flying backwards. Calling it a fight would hardly be fair. Agnes didn't stand a chance. She should be stronger than I am, Edwin mused. Agnes' visage glowed and shone a bright white light, but for whatever reason, Edwin thought this looked very natural on her. His vision faded. Within his mind, the girl with the ribbon materialized before him. There you are, mister. Quickly, this way. Let's go help Papa together. She wrapped her arms tightly around him. They were thin, cold, and strong, like a vice. Edwin let out an involuntary grunt as she squeezed him. Hey, you... 
Papa wants to get some new power soon. I want to help grant his wish, like a good little girl. Come on, let's hurry. Edwin stared at Tize. The longer he looked, the less he could accept the truth, that she was an evil spirit trapped inside a human shell. Mr. Montaigne isn't your real father, right? Edwin said in a strained voice. He did his best to give her a shaky thumbs up. If you want to meet your real father, I'll help you find him. After all, I am a righteous reporter. Ed! Ed! If I start treating him immediately, he might stand a chance. Agnes thought amidst her jumbled thoughts. If only I could just get to him. However, Montaigne was not about to allow her the chance. Agnes' body was abruptly thrown into the air by some invisible force, tumbling helplessly into the ground a distance away. I'll never m make it. I can't even stand. Agnes gasped. Tears fell from her eyes as she collapsed against the dirt. Kagemaru ran to her and motioned for her to run, but she was no longer able to detect his presence. Why, Ed? He's always been there for me, my whole life. I've kept my distance from everyone else, but he was the lone exception. My most cherished memories are the ones I spent with him. I've tried so hard to hide that, but... Ugh. Med, my one and only friend. <laughs> Absolutely magnificent. Montaigne stood at the crest of the hill with the moon at his back. You, young lady, shall be my second. Magicians truly are of immeasurable value, aren't they? I may have gained this power by chance, but now, simply by killing one magician after another... I can become omnipotent. And best of all, there are so many lives to reap for sport. <laughs> Montaigne roared with laughter. What curious creatures magicians are. Their powers are both an infinite source of desires and a boundless granter of them. The body known as Tizze stopped moving. Her face contorted as the spirit within writhed violently beneath her skin. Finally, her flesh tore, and the spirit burst forth. The shadowy form of Montaigne's magic was unmistakable, even under the shade of night. So the vessel has reached its limit, has it? No matter, Montaigne whispered. The dark energy returned to him and coiled around his body. Inflicting pain with this power brings me such joy. But I planned to finish you with my own hands anyway. Now to make bloody artwork of you. Try to enjoy yourself. I certainly will. Murderer! Agnes screamed, having lost all inhibitions. The man, clad in coils of shadow, grew intoxicated by the power enveloping him, bursting into laughter at the accusation. I'm not doing this of my own will. It's this power. Your power! You blasted magicians are to blame, thundered Hux. Before Agnes' eyes, the pitch black darkness rose over the hills and blocked out the moon before surging forth. Agnes' mind stirred. Montaigne's right. My power, the magician's power, is a curse. Misfortune befalls anybody who gets too close to us. That's why the true nature of this power must never be revealed no matter the cost. I'm sorry, Ed, Agnes thought. You always wanted to be a righteous reporter, and yet, I... Agnes solemnly closed her eyes. Chapter 13 The Magician The man, enrobed in magical power, grew increasingly maniacal. Things have been so very hard for me since obtaining this power, you know. Holding back the urge to torment, to make the light leave the eyes of others and enjoy every moment of it. I just can't help myself. It's your power that makes me feel this way. You blasted magicians are to blame. The dark energy rushed from his body and washed over the cemetery with the fury of a hurricane. 
eradicating the tombstones in its path as it steered a course toward Agnes. Then the shout of a young man cut through the gale. You're wrong! Against all odds, Edwin stood between the attacker and his prey, with his singed coat around his shoulders and his trusty messenger bag in his outstretched hands. Everyone knows that the one who does the deed is the one at fault. Don't go blaming this on magic when you don't even understand it. Moonlit confetti dotted the scene, floating gently in the air. It was the torn remnants of Ed's manuscript. He had somehow blocked the black magic with his bag. Agnes, who had just been resigned to her fate, wore a baffled expression. Edwin, you're safe. How? Edwin pointed his thumb at his chest and grinned. How many times do I have to tell you? Never underestimate a righteous reporter. Agnes had so many things she wanted to say, but in that moment, she was simply at a loss for words. I'm going to beat you down, Montaigne. And after that, you're going to give me a post-fight interview. D- don't screw with me, boy. How did that raggedy bag stop my magic? How are you even alive in the first place? Edwin responded by rushing forward without hesitation. Oh, jeez, Agnes thought. Still, that was the Edwin she knew, always true to himself, a crusader to the very end. Even now, Edwin didn't completely believe in magic. He wasn't even able to see any of Montaigne's twisted powers. But he wasn't going to rule it out as impossible or write it off as some kind of curse, He would piece the truth together himself, bit by bit. That was just the sort of boy Edwin was, recklessness and all. Kagemaru! The black cat, who was clinging to the backside of Ed's worn-out bag, had been the one who actually negated the dark mage's spell. He fixed his jet-black pupils on Agnes, as if to say, Are you sure about this? I am. I don't want to lie to him anymore. I'll show him the truth. The real me. Agnes thought back. She looked up into the night sky. It's a full moon tonight. Although there was no wind to move them, Agnes' cream blonde curls danced about as her arms erupted with rays of light, illuminating the darkness. Finale, Sunshine Agnes Edwin Arnold had never been able to get the better of that girl, not even once. He was confident in his physical strength and thought himself fairly sharp to boot. Yet despite that, he was caught in a losing streak that left him at a loss for words. Not much had changed since that day, two years ago, and perhaps it never would. The wave of light sent everything hurtling up into the sky. Edwin found himself suspended aloft, Agnes' hands in his. They were soft and warm as the sunshine. Her whole body shone, her cream blonde hair flickering like white hot flames. Thank you, Ed. It's been fun. Wait, what's going on? Where are we? Am I dreaming? (laughs) Ed, you're as dense as ever. Even though you won't be able to remember what happened today, there's something I need to tell you. Agnes smiled. It was a rare expression of pure happiness. She had never shown it to anyone before, simply because she had never been able to. Until now? I'm a magician, Ed. This is who I truly am. Edwin wasn't sure if he was shocked or if he had somehow already known. Now that he thought back on it, Agnes was smart, good in a fight, seemingly knew everything, and had a sharp intuition to boot would explain a lot if she was a magician. (laughs) Well, that's Agnes for you. Now go fix me a bourbon. If she could, she would have served him an iced tea instead. But that was impossible. Agnes was no longer in Anchorville. Edwin was finally released from the hospital after being treated for two ribs that he didn't remember breaking. From there, he boarded a long-distance orbital bus bound for the capital. It was too far a trip for his trusty bicycle. Besides, the idle time he spent in the bus would be a good chance to plan his next move. Hux Montaigne had been arrested for the murder of Weber Hart, and Ed's investigation into Tizze 
revealed that her grave had been desecrated. He prayed that she could now rest in peace. Even the deadly string of car accidents had finally come to an end. Leaning against the shaking frame of the bus, Edwin thought about the future. The people of Anchorville had completely forgotten the events of that day. Nobody knew when Agnes had vanished. Even Edwin could scarcely recall what happened that night. Every day he tried with all his might to remember. Only recently did he manage to recollect her final words to him. This won't be the last time we meet. Well, so long as you don't become a reporter, that is. Huh? What do you mean by that? Well, reporters are supposed to shine a light on the vague and obscure, aren't they? Agnes clasped a hand around the Esmolus necklace she wore. Her pain was clear as day. You're way too oblivious of your own feelings, Ed. Edwin huffed. Well, I'm still not giving up. I'm going to become a righteous reporter, no matter what she says. From his spot by the window, Edwin flicked through his notebook to check his agenda. Being a freelance reporter was more challenging than he had ever imagined. Brandon, in particular, had gotten frustrated countless times while training him. But there's no way I can back down after hearing stuff like that from Agnes, of all people. She says we can never meet again? Well, I don't believe that. I'm going to keep on being a reporter and make my feelings clear as day while I'm at it. Just you wait, Agnes. I swear that I'll find you. The wind raced across the wide open prairie. Calvert's winds were magnificent. That's a real strong gust, huh? A certain girl muttered in this very same bus, long ago, her chin resting in her hands as her cream blonde hair bobbed in the daylight. Wherever that girl went, the sunshine would follow, just as it did when she arrived in Anchorville. Edwin chuckled softly to himself. A righteous reporter can only believe what he's seen with his own eyes, you know? The bus traveled down the gravel road beneath the vast blue August sky. End. Narrated by Ethan Bradford. Thank you for listening.